What I want to see is how many of you out there can actually feather the bass drum super softly. I'm going to do all the tempos and all the baddest motherfuckers I know. Let me see what y'all got. So I have some questions about this. Ever since I cracked open John Riley's Art of Bop Drumming in high school, I've low-key practiced feathering the bass drum. It's a good idea to get this feathering thing together. It's always kind of my default when I practice jazz with independence with the left hand, like the first few pages in John's book. And recently, feathering seen kind of a resurgence as a topic because of this post from Greg Hutchinson. So this is a challenge for all my drum buddies, and I'm going to post it because you know I can do it. So let's get to that feathering. I'm going to do all the tempos and all the baddest because I know, let me see what y'all got. Because, let's be honest, a lot of us, and you know who you are, will practice feathering in the shed when we're working on hand independence, and occasionally we'll pull it out on a gig when we're tipping or locking up with the bass player in a four feel, but how many of us developed it beyond this point? Are we able to incorporate bass drum accents seamlessly the way Hutch does? basically forget about it as soon as we're mixing it up a little more. But people like Hutch and Ralph Peterson got good at mixing up feathering with bass drum accents in a way that sounds killing. I've got questions about all of this. If the mix between feathering and accents sounds so good, why are so few people teaching it? I mean really teaching it, beyond just, okay Billy, you can play page one with the bass drum on all four, cool, now let's move on to bass drum accents. And what about jazz drumming's more than 100 year history? Sure, many of the early players feathered, but what about the people after bebop? What about drummers in the 60s and beyond? Today on 8020, Feathering. If it sounds so good, why don't we hear more about it? Stay tuned. Guys, today's video is brought to you by me, the 8020 Drummer. If you like this video and you want to know a little more what we're all about, just click the link below this player, which will take you to another YouTube video, which explains the three or four controversial things we believe over here at 8020 and how they can make your drumming better. With that said, on to the video. This is me playing something that's become a jazz school classic. It's page one of John Riley's Art of Bop Drumming. John recommends playing the bass drum on all four beats of the bar while you play spangling with the lead hand and chick with the hats on two and four, then playing these comping patterns with the second hand. And John has a lot to say about the utility of feathering the bass drum. Let's listen. When I play just the cymbal, that's a high-pitched metallic sound. But I want to try and marry that with a low-pitched woody sound of the acoustic bass. And so the bass drum is going to play quarter notes underneath the ride cymbal and try and marry the sound of the cymbal to the acoustic bass. And we refer to this as feathering the bass drum. The late great Ralph Peterson Jr. also spoke about feathering. Historically, acoustic basses didn't always have amplifiers. And so feathering was created as a way to support the sound of the bass drum. So the bass drum sound should never be louder than the bass. Here's a clip of one of those old school bands. Because things like drum mics were basically non-existent, it's hard to get a sense from these old recordings of exactly how it would have sounded and felt. But luckily, we have modern, high-resolution clips, like this one from Open Studio. We should be able to hear the feathering in those, right? Here's Greg playing with Christian McBride, and it's got a super hooked up propulsive four feel. But be honest, you still can't hear the feathering, even with all this modern technology. Here's a clip with Joshua Redman and Mark Turner. Hear the kick drum feathering? No, right? But it's there. And we don't have to wonder because Greg gives us this close-up demo. Okay, now here's my fast tempo challenge. Let's see who can do it. Okay. 
So feathering isn't really meant to be heard, it's meant to be felt. And it seems like the secret ingredient to a really hooked up propulsive four feel. And it's meant to be felt and not heard. Here's Ralph again. But I want you to listen to what drumming sounds like with true feathering and not just banging 4-4 four, four on the bass drum. But it also presents a problem. If you can't hear feathering on a recording, even with all this modern drum miking technology, how do we know any of the greats actually feathered? Once we get beyond bebop, I mean. Like, here's Philly Joe Jones playing with the Miles Davis quintet. Can you tell if he's feathering between bass drum accents? Here's Max Roach. What about later drummers like Tony Williams? The only way to know is to ask people deep enough down the rabbit hole that they've seen some obscure film that shows their feet. Which is gonna be rare because you know what makes terrible television in the 50s? Footage of a drummer's feet. Or else talk to someone who saw them play up close. Luckily, we also have some printed interviews with some jazz greats themselves. Like these in the Jazz Heaven discussion group. So you can read people like Arthur Taylor in their own words. Let's listen to Art Taylor's playing on Coltrane's Giant Steps while we see what he has to say. Play everything you can with the bass drum on every beat, playing it so you can hardly even hear it. If you don't play it, there's no bottom. Just touch that bass drum, and if you can do all those combinations and play that too, there's no way you're not going to be a good drummer, because you have a foundation for the other musicians to play on, and your timing is going to get better. So it sure sounds like Art Taylor was feathering the bass drum, even between bass drum accents. Let's listen to another famous recording from Giant Steps. This is Cousin Mary during Coltrane's solo. It's hard to hear the bass drum per se, but you do hear that amazing hookup with Paul Chambers' bass, and if we take Art at his word, we have to assume he's feathering the drum. And so the bass drum is going to play quarter notes underneath the ride cymbal and try and marry the sound of the cymbal to the acoustic bass, and we refer to this as feathering the bass drum. What about the mad scientist of solos, combos, and odd times? Max Roach was instrumental in elevating the drums to a solo instrument and playing melody on the drums. Here's what Max said about feathering the kick. You could not get a job unless the band leader could hear that 4-4 on the bass drum. I remember standing in front of Chick Webb's drum set. His bass drum was so strong and constant, I could hear it in my stomach. Boom, 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 constantly. Then, on 52nd Street, we learned how to play the bass drum softly. It was always there underneath the bass fiddle, but you never heard it on the recordings. He goes on to say this, which underscores some of the misunderstanding. We played the bass drum, but the engineers would cover it up because it would cause distortion due to the technology at the time. There were never any mics near our feet. They would have one mic above the drum set and that was all. While we think about Max, let's listen to Delilah, which he recorded with Clifford Brown in 1954. It's starting to feel like case closed. Guys, forgive me, but I'm starting to feel like Dan Brown here or something. This is a lost art you don't hear a lot about, and that's largely because early recordings didn't capture it. I mean, it's not totally underground, because a lot of jazz drum teachers who understood the old school and actually met some of the greats still talk about it, but it's been largely lost to history in a lot of circles. Here's the crux. We all learned to play the kick drum on all four as a practice technique, but the idea that we should learn to do it even when we're playing the bass drum accents as part of the phrase kind of got lost. Before I get too excited, I want to send a text to my former teacher and mentor, John, to learn his opinion. And here's another thing. Tony Williams, Elvin, and Jack DeJanet. What about those later jazz drummers, and what about drummers post-amplification? Like, here's Elvin Jones playing three-card Molly with Pat LaBarbera, Ryo Kawasaki, and David Williams. Was Elvin feathering the bass drum? Based on my pet theory, for this part of the tune, it sure seems like it. I'd bet 65-35 he is. Luckily, there's a printed interview with Elvin in that Jazz Heaven article. Actually, my feet are always going on four, but for some reason I have a light touch on the bass drum and it doesn't always project, because I don't want it to project. I don't think it should, and so that's probably the reason why you don't think I'm playing four on the bass drum all the time. I'm not, of course, but most of the time I am. 
It's just subdued and dynamically pulled back. Let's listen to Alvin on Zolotan from Larry Young's Unity record. Whoa, that feels good. Anyway, we don't get much of a four feel because he goes back to that groove on what jazz musicians call the last day. But that four feel sure comports with what Alvin said in the interview. I'm about ready to call case closed on this, but I need to resolve one more. I'm sure you know who I'm thinking of. At the risk of making jazzers glaze over, this is Tony Williams. But did Tony feather the kick? So there's no direct interview with Tony in the archive, but a couple of other drummers who knew and observed Tony chimed in. While we hear from Ed Thigpen, let's listen to Hand Jive from Miles Davis's record Nefertiti. Okay, here goes. I've got some recordings of Tony Williams with Miles where, if you have a good amplifier and can switch channels, you can hear him playing soft four on the bass drum. But Ed goes on, and this is spicy. One thing that really makes me angry is these guys who write these jazz history books and come out with these ridiculous statements. The one that kills me is that Kenny Clark revolutionized jazz drumming because he quit playing the bass drum on all four beats. That is absolutely false. He played soft four on the floor and accented within that, the same way Max did, the same way Blakey did. And if it weren't fast approaching, case closed, John got back to me. So let's recap. Somebody somewhere wrote that Kenny Clark stopped feathering the bass drum. Then that got passed down the line, so everybody just kind of assumed that post-bebop, nobody really did this anymore. But actually, that's dead wrong. Kenny, Max, Art Taylor, Elvin Tony, all of them feathered the kick drum. And here's why it feels so natural and so right. Also, John probably already told me this, so it's not like there's some big conspiracy to keep it secret. Yeah, just there's zero chance that in two years of grad school, John never mentioned this to me. So it would appear I've got a practice challenge cut out for me. Of course, we've all spent years practicing John's book with the hand independence exercises, but I'm going to shed the foot independence stuff, doing as John suggests, and stopping a beat before the accent. It has to feel second nature, otherwise it's not going to swing and flow. Eventually, I'll practice improvising with it. But how will I know when I've got the idea? And who will tell me if I'm on the right track, or if it's hot trash? And where can I get a gut check on this whole conspiracy theory of mine? That's coming up! on the next installment of the Feathering series. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this one. And if you're new to the channel, click the link below this video to learn a little more about us. Always have fun doing these. See you guys again in another lesson of the week. As usual, I can't really tell what I look like.